From a sepia-toned indoor soundstage that's supposed to look like Kansas, it's the IGN DigiGuys. So please welcome two men who know how to follow a yellow brick road, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. Yeah, our first new intro with Corey. Corey, welcome everybody. Corey in the house. Wait a minute, that's a TV show. This is our good friend Corey. Corey... Who sent that one in? Go ahead, tell us. That was written by Lenny Timmons as he hung himself in the background. Oh, that's not true, is it? Really? Corey? Urban legend. Oh, oh good for you, manufacturing a conversation. <laughs> that never really happened, Wade. That's great. That's Corey. Corey, is a, uh, Corey was a mainstay, linchpin, key component... Corey did all the of, graphics uh, on uh, Stupid for Movies. Stupid for Movies, of Corey course. Corey is a man of many talents. Uh, Corey's a rise... Multifaceted. His rise of the Planet of the Apes uh, uh, phony poster is still my iPhone wallpaper. Hyphenate. Exactly. Corey actually has television writing credits, by the way. He doesn't brag about it, but I'll brag for him. Really? Yeah, you didn't know that? I did not. Corey, what, ro- Corey wrote a Star Trek episode. Did you not know that? Uh, the original Star Trek? No, the, I, I think a Next Generation episode. Did he really? Yeah. Corey's... Corey. That, that got produced? Yeah. I did not know that. I know, right? Unbelievable. Right? Fuh? Right? Fuh? <laughs> to ya? Well, let's say... Well, th- first of all, let's before we move on... Yes. Talk about uh, mm. Super 8, a couple of good criterions. The West controversy Side Story. over West Side Story. Yes. Controversy, yes. Uh, By the way, artist best film of the year. I'm just saying it's not DVDs, but we just got back from the uh, the uh, the big shindig. You saw the film. I saw it last week. I was at Hugo, and then I went by for free food. But um, pretty awesome. It is. And by the way, may I say the best thing about the artist is the fact that it allowed me for the second day in a row to see in person George Takei. (laughs) <laughs> so the, last he, night he walked right past us as we're eating all these r- ridiculous little fried hors d'oeuvres and so last night I'm, I'm at the Baja Fresh I had to work last night which kind of blew but so I had to work and I went across the street to buy the crew dinner I'm just hanging out I can I'll go sure. across the street and pick up dinner it's fine I'm just waiting on them so I go in there and there's uh, Mr. Sulu and, and the th- thing is that I, I didn't know it was him when he walked up to the counter but then when I heard him say I need some. I need a spoon for my soup, please. <laughs> I need a spoon for my I'm soup, the, please. The, uh, and they said, "Oh my!" He didn't say, "Oh my." He just said, <laughs> "I need a spoon for my soup, please." Yeah. I said, "Oh my God, that's Mr. Sulu!" And then tonight, as I am scarfing down free food at a, at a premiere, which yeah. I want to do during this time of the year, who do I see? Mr. Sulu. Yeah, but the, but you're you're leaving out the funny part. Before he walked by, we saw Angie Dickinson. And uh, Mike Farrell. And for a moment, it was like, did somebody just scrape the guest list out of the 1972 banker's box? What What? The, what did they wow, do? It's, the, it's the premiere for Smoking the Bandit. <laughs> I know. It's like, wow, this is, this, is, this is probably the first you know screening of this type these people have been invited to in 30 years. I, it is bizarre that yeah, they'd be weird. invited to that. Yeah. But it was true. It was Mike Farrell, uh, Angie Dickinson we saw, uh, uh, Mr. Sulu. Yeah. And uh, and you weird. and I just eating nothing but food. Okay. With Tim. So, uh, yes, the art is very good. One of the best films of the year, uh, certainly. Pretty awesome. And it's good stuff. Even right. better stuff is all of the DVDs we need to talk about this week. Start with movies? <gasps> look, look, Wade, you I realize, know. okay, you realize that the movie, that the movie that's on the top of the pile was, was routine, was at the time totally dismissed. Spy Kids? Yes. At, I like Spy <laughs> Kids, actually. At the time, totally dismissed, but yes. only... Only in later decades did it really start to get put up on this pedestal as being one of the greatest films ever made. You're talking about Rules of the Game. I'm talking about Rules of the Game. The amazing genre noir film. We have a crap load, and that is an official word in the, US, in the uh, uh, American uh, language dictionary. Not English language, but American language. Crap load. It's a word. We have a crap load of criterions today, and one of the great ones is Rules of the Game. Rules of the Game, of course, has been out before on DVD. It is now out on Blu-ray from 1939, one of the great movie years of all time, but it doesn't necessarily fall in with all of that uh, Wizard of Oz and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and Gone with the Wind and Gunga Din and all that stuff because it's foreign. Uh, but yeah, it's also a it's also a satirical slice at uh, yes. fr- the French upper class. It is, but boy, what a great movie it is! Great artwork too. I mean, that's like the that's the original 
French artwork on the cover, and it's just terrific. No, this is great. You know, uh, Criterion did well by this when it was on uh, DVD, yeah. and now they're doing equally well, better, now that well, it's on Blu-ray. The, here's what I, I love on DVD, and I love on this as well. They got, there are just so many people who pay oh, the, their, their tributes to this. I mean, you've got Bogdanovich and uh, Alexander Sosong, Sosonsky, um doing an audio commentary, and it's, uh, it's actually an audio commentary that was written by Sosonsky, and it's read by Bogdanovich, so it's kind of weird, but it's very cool. There's also a uh, Chris Faulkner analysis. There's uh, David Thompson uh, shows up in here with this amazing 1993 documentary that he did for the BBC. Uh, Jacques Rivette did a French television program on the film. I mean, it's like everybody gets in on this. It's amazing how many people just love this movie, and they all weigh in on it here. And uh, it's really outstanding. It, just about every great filmmaker you can imagine loves this movie, and they all show up somewhere in the featurettes or the documentaries just lavishing praise on it. It's fantastic. Really, and, really good. And by the way, you know, Renoir is in the film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Big, hulking. The, the son of Auguste, the painter. He's the son of the, he is the son of the painter. Yep. yep. And Renoir had one of the great uh, careers in uh, the movies. Just unbelievable talent. I mean, he directed, I mean, come on. He directed, uh, you know, The Lower Depths, Grand Illusion, uh, you know, what what else? The Diary of a Chambermaid, The oh, River. That's just unbelievable. It, one of the great careers. As great in <gasps> cinema as his father was. I and, love this movie. I know. That's another criterion. Mark, tell us what we got. I want it. Give me Yankee Wade. When City Lumet died, it was a big, big deal because I love City Lumet. Yeah, He's totally. the man. He is. And he directed uh, a little movie called Twelve Angry Men. Now, uh, this was Lamette's first film, and you know this coming out of television. Coming out of television, out. yeah, he was he was a big deal. He was big cheese in uh, live television. That is right. And this movie was it was it was the perfect first film for him. Also, it is um, deceptively difficult to direct a film where it's really just twelve guys sitting around a table. Yeah, but you've got to make it interesting. And you've got to cut and place the camera in certain ways totally so that true. you're accentuating, you know, conflict between characters as as it starts to, as it starts to shift as they deliberate against, uh, you know, during the case. Total trueness. And uh, it's great. It's really great. It's um, it's a great Blu-ray. It's got a great new high definition transfer. It's um, it's got a it's got a 1955 television version, which is also pretty interesting. Two years before the film came out. There's archival interviews with Lamette, who just uh, died recently. Very tragic. Uh, new interviews with the screenwriter and um, uh, what else? A booklet, which is cool. And a new interview with the cinematographer, John Bailey. Actually, a new uh, interview with John Bailey about the original cinematographer, Boris Kaufman. Uh, very good stuff. He's got a great cast. Henry Fonda has up the cast. And uh, this is just a great, great movie. I love this movie, and you're taking it back. Yeah, I, uh, I love Twelve. And by the way, this was remade recently by... Uh is a Russian film called Twelve, which was very good, and, and I, I, I was predisposed against it. it, it Nikita, but it's good. Ni- Nikita Mikalkov, who won the Academy Award for *Burnt by the Sun*, and who is brothers with uh, Andrei Konchalovsky. Don't ask me why they don't have the same last name. Some weird Russian patronymic thing, but it actually is pretty good. But it's like twice as long as Twelve Angry Men*. That's a long movie. Wade. Twelve. Wade. Yeah. Why don't they have the same last name? Uh, it's some weird Russian patronymic thing. Uh, another criterion, and this is not the end today. The big, the big mama criterion is later on. My pick of the week. What? Yes, that's right. But this is uh, this is also quite good. I I have really Wes Anderson has fallen off of my radar lately. I, I kind of feel like I was sold a bill of goods, but I still like Rushmore. I still think it has funny moments. I still think Bill Murray is great, and I still think that. Uh, Jason Schwartzman is funny in it, even though he really does pretty much the same shtick over and over and over and over. Anyway, this is the uh, Rushmore Blu-ray, exactly the same as the Rushmore DVD, except it looks better. It doesn't look markedly better. It's just, you know, better. Uh, The Blu-ray, that's not saying anything bad about the Blu-ray. That's just saying that the DVD was already pretty darn good. Wes Anderson does all of his stuff through Criterion and uh, insists that his movies always be Criterion releases, and Criterion obviously appreciates that, so that's the way that goes. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you uh, don't have the DVD, it's worth checking out the Blu-ray because it's got all kinds of fun stuff on it, like the um, Bill Murray interview on the Charlie Rose show, which is one of the best Charlie Rose segments ever. And that almost is worth the, the, purchase, price, uh, the purchase price alone. You mean Charlie Rose, who's going to the uh, CBS early show? Don't get me started. That's so weird. It is weird, but what's interesting is that whereas, and we'll, whereas all the other morning shows are getting more frothy and frivolous. I know. 
here comes CBS going the other way. Which they're getting they, more newsy. But they have to. Well, I mean, they can't like out. They can't like you know out shallow the Today Show and Good Morning America. Uh, well, they're not. They're not, but they could if they wanted. Yes, they could. All right, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna blow through a bunch of Miramax. We got some Miramax uh, releases here from uh, Echo Bridge that I'm gonna blow through. You do that, Wade. And then you can. We'll let you run with a couple of these these real serious things. Uh, you know, uh, Miramax is releasing a lot of stuff, and uh, a lot of this is catalog stuff, and some of it ain't. But uh, we've got a whole ton of Spy Kids this week, and I think they coordinated this because here's what we got: we got releasing through um, Lionsgate the triple feature three Blu-ray set of Spy Kids, Spy Kids Two, and Spy Kids Three Game Over, which is just horrendous. And then we have separately being released through Anchor Bay uh, via the Weinstein Company, because they did that whole Miramax-Weinstein split thing, uh, Spy Kids All the Time in the World. Uh, But this is not on Blu-ray. This is on DVD. And uh, totally different kids. And, uh, you know. I like the Spy Kids movies. I do. I admit it. I I really, You know what? I love Spy Kids, too. Everyone hates Spy Kids, too, except me. I liked it. I don't. I don't get them. I don't like them because you don't but, like you don't like uh, Rodriguez. No, I don't. And I think the whole Spy Kids thing is just you know CGI hell and it's dumb. But what I do enjoy is this uh, little toy that they sent us. They sent us the uh, micro ear gear spy gear thing where you can uh, hear far away and see in the dark. Uh, these are cheesy little plastic gizmos that uh, are supposed to make us positively review their movies or something. I don't really understand it. One is just basically a, like a little earphone with a microphone that's attached to a cord, and the other one is some kind of a laser light that you snap onto your ear. So it's, uh, you know, if your kids start clamoring for this for Christmas, just get it for them because it costs like a couple of bucks, and it'll it'll shut the little brats up. You are a Scrooge. I am, aren't I? You are a stinker. Uh, here's, here's the rest of the Miramax stuff in a, in a quick blitz. And this is all Echo Bridge. This is all this ty- uh, catalog stuff from Echo Bridge. Uh, some of it better than others, but it's all been released before. Nothing new about this. These are all the same exact releases as previously uh, came out from Buena Vista when Miramax was part of the Disney umbrella. Now the Miramax library is elsewhere, thanks to Ron Tudor, and they cut a deal with Echo Bridge, among others. So all of the kind of uh, scattershot catalog stuff is being released by Echo Bridge, starting with... Brideshead Revisited. No, not the television series, but the movie with Matthew Good and Ben Whishaw and uh, Emma Thompson and Michael Gambon. What happened to Ben Whishaw, um, by the way? Wait. He'll come back. He's, he, he was he, so good in he, perfume yeah, I and know. he was like right on the he's, cusp. He'll, he'll, didn't he'll, happen. He, it, it will. He's still, he's still got it. But there's a lot of great British talent. That's the problem. Um, this is not as good as the television version. It's a little more... Uh, I don't know. It's a little more twee. That's a that's a Kaiser word, but it feels a little more twee. It tries to sort of uh, you know be a little bit more Merchant Ivory, uh, as if this really needs any more Merchant Ivory sensibility. But uh, you know Julian Gerald who directed it, very capable, very good. Uh, Tom and Viv, a film that I absolutely adore, and I don't know why this never caught fire. This is the story of uh, T. S. Eliot, played by um, uh, Willem Dafoe, and his uh, very turbulent relationship with his incredibly unstable wife Vivienne. Uh, it's a, a terrific movie directed by Brian Gilbert, who's a real workmanlike uh, guy from the whole BBC tradition. Very, very sharp film. I really enjoyed it when this was released. I thought, uh, you know, one of the best things that I've ever seen Willem Dafoe do. Uh, Down in the Delta, I'm not so fond of, but it does feature a surprisingly genteel performance from Wesley Snipes. He's not blowing anybody up. He's not shooting anybody. He's just a he's a real sweet guy, and you, he reminds you that he can be a very decent actor. Also, a lovely performance for Alfred Woodard. Uh, but apart from that, it's just one of those kind of, you know, schmaltzy movies about, you know, the, the closeness of family. And anytime those movies deal with the closeness of a black family, somehow they kind of tend to fall into stereotypes that I just don't particularly like. Soul Food is the only one of those movies that I really responded to. Barbershop. But otherwise it kind of, yeah, not really, not so much. Uh, Jane Eyre, no, not the more recent Jane Eyre. This is the uh, th- this is the eighteenth version of Jane Eyre, as opposed to the twenty seventh that came out more recently. Uh, this is a Jane Eyre version that was directed, believe it or not, by Franco Zeffirelli back in nineteen ninety six, with uh, an incredibly miscast William Hurt as Rochester and an absolutely delightful Charlotte Gainsbourg as Jane Eyre. Um, n- not exactly the most faithful version, but uh, Gainsbourg is very, very good in it. Uh, unfortunately, William Hurt is not so good. And Zeffirelli is kind of, you know, he's, he's used it all up. 
A movie I was very fond of, made my top ten list that year, was Cry the Beloved Country. Cry the Beloved Country is a uh, terrific film from 1995 that f- is a remake, actually, of uh, a, an older film by the same title. But this is well worth seeing because James Earl Jones and Richard Harris are both so phenomenally good. Uh, it's an apartheid film, if you've never seen it. It uh, deals with two fathers, one black, one white, but their performances are just extraordinary. And the whole tragedy that brings them together, it, it kind of, you know, it's... It could have been a movie about sort of archetypes where each one is representing the racial, you know, their various racial groups in this racial divide in South Africa. But really it doesn't. It transcends all that and becomes a lovely story about just two men. And then a movie that a lot of people ripped on, and I think very unfairly, John Madden, before he made Shakespeare in Love, made a movie called Ethan Frome uh, based on the novel. And I've never read the novel. Uh, I've heard that the novel is rather wonderful. But it's a you know, novel written by Edith Wharton. Um, nonetheless, the movie is very dour. features a good performance by uh, Liam Neeson, a decent performance by Patricia Arquette. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, it's... If Jane, if Jane Austen had no sense of humor and no sense of romance and wrote all of her films and uh, wrote all of her books uh, set in the snow somewhere in the United States, it would probably be Ethan Frome. That's beautiful way. All right, there's the Miramax Blitz. Miramax <laughs> Library. Let's more films. Wade. More films. Uh, big, big controversy, Wade. What's let's, the controversy, Mark? Let's talk about West Side Story. I love West Side Story. It's a movie. That, uh, won, that won nine Academy Awards. Ten. Ten. Oh, that's right. Ten Academy Awards in 1961. That is true. This is a, a three-disc set, which, of course, means uh, nothing because two of the discs you'll never watch. You know, there's a, uh, there's a DVD version of this, a special edition DVD that I... From a, an extra standpoint... Size, size of a small encyclopedia. Yes. Mm-hmm. From an extra standpoint... Pretty terrific. Better than the Blu-ray. Yeah. But picture-wise, the Blu-ray yeah, I'll, I'll wins see. out. The color's great. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's... I'm not sure what, what print they use, but it was a great print that they cleaned up. Black levels are good. Um, the controversy, which is really a pisser, I have to say, is that they screwed up the opening credits. And uh, there was an, that was an outrage uh, directed towards Fox. Fox has now redirected the outrage towards MGM, and MGM has taken ownership of the mistake. Man, it's unbelievable. And it's my good friend Robert Harris who caught it. That is right. Bob Bob nailed it. I don't know why. You know what? All these studios, all, listen to me. I'm, I'm talking right now to everybody out there, who, uh, who all you distributors who have classic films that you're about to just completely ruin. Here's the problem. You have people on staff who don't know these movies. They just sit there. These are, these are you know, just transfer monkeys. They throw the thing on the telecine machine. They just throw the switch, and they let it go. Stop it. Hire Bob Harris to tell you if you're doing a good job. He knows all these movies inside out. Just hire the man. Pay him a, pay him a small fee for crying out loud. You know, that's what he does. He knows this stuff. You're getting expertise that you cannot get anywhere else. Take advantage of it. My gosh. That is you're, true. You're imbeciles. And just so you know, the uh, the mistake is at the end of the credits, there is a, um, in the feature film, as directed by Mr. Weiss. Robert Wise. Director of Star Trek, the motion picture. That's right. Um, God. And the sound of music. And the Andromeda strain. And the uh, Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, there is and Rooftops. A, Remember uh, Rooftops? He, yes. He did Rooftops. Uh, that was early Wise. He, he, no, no, he, roof, no, Rooftops is his last film. Oh, that's right. That was, that was the musical. That was the musical. Yes. That was like the street dancing thing. He edited Citizen Kane. That's right. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the mistake is that uh, there's a cross-dissolve. In the original print, there's a cross-dissolve between the end of the end credits, the end of the opening credits, and the beginning of the film. Cross-dissolve between the end of the opening credits and the beginning of the film. Mm-hmm. Well, what the Transfer Monkey did is instead of doing the cross-dissolve, he actually fades out. The end, the opening credits, crime, and fades back in that's the opening shot of the, the film. I don't, I don't, I can't even fathom how that could happen. I just, I, it's like seems like so improbable. It is bizarre. Yeah. Uh, Fox is actually kind of owning owning it a little bit. They are they are offering to uh, swap out flawed versions with new versions once they get around to redoing the shot. I don't know whether they've redone it yet. I'm not sure whether it's just a case by case wow. basis they, they, they don't seem to be interested in recalling these so if you're a total West Side Story purist you're going to be offended this will really piss you off it really will the rest of it is fine I have to say the extras were better on the uh, DVD version but you know what it looks great and that's the most important thing it's got, it, it really is weird like it looks great except for this this embarrassing mistake the extras are better on the DVD 
It, it, it really is almost a wash, actually. It, 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 it's, it feels to me like what they really should do is come out with uh, a, a proper Blu-ray special whiz-bang edition that has everything from the DVD and a corrected version on Blu-ray. That's what they just, should have. You know, do that. And, but uh, the problem is they can't do that now for like another six months. You know, you gotta you gotta wait a little bit. You can't come out with yet another West Side Story version just within weeks of of this one. So, whatever. So here's the thing: the DVD looks great, but there's a embarrassing flaw at the top. So I don't know what to tell you. It's a tough one. Yeah, it is. It's a tough one. I I love it only because I love West Side Story. But God, that's just a pisser. Uh, also on Blu-ray this week is Super 8 from J.J. Uh, Abrams. And um, I had mixed feelings about this movie. You know, J.J., um, you know, I... I, I you're, talking I about, you're talking about the same J.J. who recently turned in his uh, casting director from this film for being basically a pedophile. That was a very strange story because, like, <laughs> he went... He went totally public on that. I mean, the Times, the L.A. Times, they interviewed well, him. you know, the guy, for those who don't know this, the guy who was the casting director for Super 8... Well, not some, the casting director. Well, he... He was some assistant he was, or something he's, like that. He's basically the guy who cast the kids. He's not the number one casting director for the film, but he cast the kids. It was his... Through his uh, company that the kids were, you know, pulled together. He specializes in kids, so to speak. And um, so does Jerry Sandusky. Yeah, boy, jeez, what a story. Whatever his name is. Yeah, no, it's Jerry Sandusky. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, anyway, this uh, this guy's been going by you know not using his last name for a number of years, so nobody ever tracked him down on the uh, sexual predator list or whatever they call that thing. And uh, it was JJ who discovered that uh, he was doing this, and under the terms of his you know probation and parole or whatever, he's not supposed to be around kids at all. And he was like casting them in movies because he, yeah, he was uh, he just, was working under a different name. Oh my god, so uh, not JJ's fault. So let's um, no JJ freaking turned him in exactly as yeah. well he should. Um, you know, I I sort of liken JJ to Quentin Tarantino in that they are both slaves to their influences. Yes, but I will say that whereas Tarantino takes those influences and he owns them and he synthesizes them into something totally unique. Yeah. yeah. I don't think J.J. does that yet. No. And I know he has it in him, and I want to, I do want to see him do great. I really root for him. I was not a huge fan of this movie. I thought it was, it was perfectly, perfectly fine. But um, I was a little disappointed because I just feel like he needs to go beyond uh, what he loved as a kid. Yeah, I no, I agree with that. It, yeah. it, it just feels too throwback to... I mean, it's sweet and all. I, I appreciate what he's what he's going for, but you know, it's like the movies that he's referencing are better movies. I will say about the Blu-ray is gorgeous. Blu-ray is absolutely one hundred percent gorgeous. It uh, the colors the colors are just vibrant and uh, it looks great, and the the detail is amazing, and the, the depth and the blacks and it's just, it looks great. It's a great looking Blu-ray. It's almost I would say it's almost reference quality. That's what you're getting. Um, the audio is also is good. Now there's a uh, there's some great extras on, including an audio commentary by JJ and uh, Wade Brian Burke. Yes, is there too? Who I just talked to like two days ago, <laughs> which, is, which makes the whole thing even more surreal. Well, why is he not giving any giving any scoop on Star Trek Two? Because I didn't ask for it. Well, how could you not? How could you talk to Brian and not talk about Star Trek Two? The, the conversation lasted about eighteen seconds. <laughs> You know how those conversations go? It goes, it goes like this. It's like I'll send an email, and then like two days later I'll get a phone call. Yes, hi, Wade Major. Please hold, please hold for Brian Burke. You know, it's like the assistant Is thing. Is he really right? doing that? They all do to it. you? Yeah, of course. He does it to everybody. They all do it. That's what, you get to a certain level, it's like, yes, please hold for uh, X-Men. Please hold for Sam Buckbottom. That's what it is. It's, that's the way it goes. Oh, it's so bad. <laughs> it's great. Uh, anyway, this is kind of I kind of dig it actually. It's sort of cool. It's got it's got a lot of great extras on it. There's there's an extra. Uh, there's a, a short featurette on uh, Michael Giacchino, the composer, who's very yeah. talented. Already won an Oscar. And that's kind of nice because Wade and I are big film movie buffs. Oh, the, the movie score buffs. Yeah, movie score buffs. Um, that that. Did I say film movie buffs? Yes. You did, did I say that? We're, we're, we we rock and roll here, and we stumble over our words every once in a while. And don't uh, stop the recording. I won't. See, when I yell "Don't stop the recording," that means I have screwed up, and I, I and do wanna not want to hide it. You want to own it from America. We got a quartet of films here from Vanguard, and we're going to finish on a real killer of a film. I got to tell you, uh, one here though is called Dark Room, which is a pretty cool little uh, psychological drama about a guy who develops uh, crime scene photographs, and it. Uh, 
has a profoundly disruptive effect on his life and his marriage and everything else. It's allegedly based on a true story. Interesting little uh, little indie, really very well done, and uh, has a, has terrific um, commentaries on it. Two different commentary tracks. Um, definitely worth checking out. That's a good one. And Todd Bridges is in this, by the way. Todd Bridges. And then another little film here called Commit uh, by a surprisingly talented director called Mickey Blaine. And I say surprisingly just because I, you know, normally when a film is this accomplished, I've heard of it and I've heard of the people who make it. But it, uh, this really, I enjoyed it. I love black comedy. I, uh, and this is, this is really black romantic comedy and uh, kind of the kind of thing that I would have hoped that Tarantino might have made at one point in his life. Um, kind of like if Tarantino had done a low-budget version of War of the Roses, maybe. Maybe kind of, sort of a little bit. Um, anyway, uh, Michael Blaine, very talented. Love to see some more stuff from him. Uh, basically, it's uh, it's a the the relationship here is between a substitute teacher and um, a an emotionally disturbed detective. Um, we'll can, I, leave... can I tell you about Commit? Huh. This is my memory of Commit. Yeah. In Star Trek Two. Oh dear. When Khan is uh, about to activate the Genesis device. And then he actually activates yeah. it. Yeah. There's a sign on the Enterprise uh-huh. that says commit. Yeah. Which is telling the audience that he has activated this device. So there's no going back. What does that have to do with this movie? Because it's, co- it's commit. Because oh, for so- some reason on the Enterprise, there is a sign that just says the word commit. I mean, can you imagine how many signs there must be on the Enterprise if like every noun, verb, and adjective has like its own sign? And on the Enterprise, they got a sign that says commit. You know, Mark, there's a, uh, there's a really good little animated film that Van Ar- Vanguard is releasing uh, this month as well. It's called Jester Till. We love this film. You know why we love it? Because we did the commentary. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. It's the commentary. It's totally cool. Uh, <laughs> no, the, uh, the veteran animation uh, guy, well, not animation, just a veteran veteran producer and filmmaker, uh, Eberhard Junkersdorf directed it and wrote it. And it's based on a really cool little, um, you know, it, it harkens back to the whole Disney fairy tale adaptation thing. It's got a little bit of Aladdin in it, and it's, uh, you know, got a little bit of the Disney style in it. But it's really very cool all on its own, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it. So, you know, what are we going to do? We're going we're gonna to rip this thing? No, we want you to buy it. We, want you to, we, don't, we don't have a piece of this. No, we don't. We don't have a piece of this. We just did the commentary. Oh, but... no, I have a piece of it. Do you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that being said, never mind. Mark... Oh, I, I, you didn't ask what my piece, uh, piece is. What is your piece? For every copy of this film, of this DVD that's sold, yes. I get nothing. Oh, that's every awesome. copy. Every yeah. copy. If it sells one, it sells a million. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter. For every copy, I get nothing. Outstanding. You know what? Ch- definitely check it out. This is a really fun animated film that just went beneath a lot of people's radar. It did not get theatrically released in the U.S. It should have. It's great. Jester Till. Jester, as in, you know, like court jester. Jester Till. T I L L. Very old story. Very old legend story. It's cool. You, know what? you know what? It's a cute film. It's very Disney esque. All right, Mark. Yes. We're gonna we're gonna get controversial here. Yeah, we 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 wait. We already got controversial. More you think there's more controversy? Lot lots more. Wow. Because silent films are all the rage again. All of a sudden. I mean, isn't that weird? Like two films open this week, and I'm gonna be talking about them on the radio on NPR this week. But two films open this week that both take place during the same period. They're both uh, tributes to silent cinema. One is an American director paying tribute to French silent cinema in uh, Hugo, the Scorsese film. And the other is my favorite film of the year, uh, The Artist, which is uh, the director of the OSS 117 films with the star of those films, uh, doing an amazing silent film. It's not just a tribute. It is a silent film. I mean, it's amazing. It's a a tribute film. And you know what? It's funny how in the summertime, it's... You know, Transformers and all this stuff yeah. that is way over here. Yep. But now it's the fall, and you've got something that is it's 180 just... degrees totally different. It's In fact, it's silent. It's it's incredible. Well, we have two D.W. W. Griffith films. D.W. Griffith, one of the great directors of the silent era, the guy who basically invented the feature-length film. And we've got the film here that was that film. This was the beginning of feature-length uh, filmmaking, and it is to this day incredibly controversial because it is considered so flagrantly and unapologetically and blatantly and unbelievably racist. That's Birth of a Nation. Uh, D.W. Griffith uh, made this film that was meant to be a, well, you know, a depiction of... It was a very favorable um, depiction of the Old South, 
and uh, you know the Civil War and Reconstruction, and it's this huge sprawling epic. It's a bit of a trial to watch. I, I got to tell you, the thing's over three hours long. So when we say he invented the feature length film, oh, he invented it all right. He pushed it right out to the the, the outer edges. Uh, this thing is three hours and twelve minutes long, and um, it is. If, I'm sorry, you know, if you if you have any kind of a a conscience with respect to how black people are depicted in movies, this is just going to enrage you. Uh, yeah, but here's it, the thing: is but that it is it is a product of its time, and that's yes. what we have to remember. I mean, I I taught this in school, you know, and you have to load up your lecture with caveats, and you have to say, look. Just so you understand, this is when this was made, and by whom, and under what circumstances, and you know that doesn't mean I mean, you this have is to, 1915. You, you doesn't mean you have to approve of it. Doesn't mean you have to forgive it. But it is you have to appreciate what it was at the time. And let's keep debating it. Let's let's have that argument. I mean, I think it's healthy to not ignore the film. It's healthy to talk about it and to make sure that we're you know we acknowledge its place in history without necessarily. Uh, giving it any any kind of credit for its ideas, I think that's important. I do too. And you know what? I, the thing is, is that you can say what you want about its politics, but the fact is, this movie really did invent. It did. It, it, it invented storytelling on film. It's inc- it, it, is, it is from that standpoint, it is extraordinary, uh, especially the fact that it sustains its storytelling over the course of three hours. You have to understand too, like some of the stuff in this film seems obvious to us now. Yeah, but people had never seen. It's like. True. You know, somebody uh, – there's a wide shot of somebody about to cry. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly you cut to a close-up of, of that Gish. person's face. Yeah. Let's say Lillian Gish. Yeah. That close-up, the idea mm-hmm. that you can have a continuous cut where you go from something wide – playing in front of you like mm-hmm. a stage play, like a proscenium art shot, yep. to cut to something close, that same person close up to get really a look at their emotion. That was like, there was a time when somebody invented that. Nobody True. had ever cut to a close up before, ever. That's it. And Griffith was that guy, pretty much. He was, he was almost pretty much inventing the language of cinema as we still speak it. Well, this is an amazing... But the film is horribly racist. I mean, it, no, no, it is. not about it that. Is. But I'm just saying that given that the language of film was almost wholly invented in this film. This is a walloping three-disc special edition. Uh, the movie itself comes on a Blu-ray. And what a Blu-ray it is. A really, really great uh, lossless DTS HD score by the uh, Mont Alto Motion Picture Orchestra, which is just fantastic. Uh, the movie itself, and then they, you know, which also comes with uh, spoken introductions by D.W. Griffith and Walter Houston, and uh, even as the newly rediscovered intermission sequence, which I had never seen before, it's you know nothing mind-boggling, but it's it, it, it's it, it's more faithful to the original vision. And then you have a couple of DVDs, not Blu-rays, but a couple of DVDs with all the extras on them and a whole lot of other fun stuff, uh, different score and uh, a making of featurette and a whole lot of shorts that D.W. Griffith uh, did, you know, prior to this, all of them kind of obsessing on the Civil War. And you could tell this is the guy who, you know, came from a Confederate family. So, And bear in mind, you know, the Civil War was not that distant of a memory when he made this film. I mean, it's, it's you know... Within, oh, if, if the Civil War ended, what, in 1865, within, something like that? It was within 50 years. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's His like... His family... That's like, that's like the Kennedy administration to us. Sure. You know, I mean, it's... We, we, gotta, we, gotta, we gotta remember that. So, uh, you know, a lot of people still around who remember Kennedy. Uh, and so, likewise, at the time, a lot of people around who remembered the Civil War. So we got to remember that. But really, a, a tremendous Blu-ray transfer. I got to say, it's you, you. You see flaws in the film that I don't think they ever imagined would be visible. Don't forget too is that this this film was so was received so. I mean, it was a huge, huge, enormous box office hit at the time. You know what? Many people still believe. And, I, I, you know, the numbers are tough to come by, but a, a lot of calculations still estimate that this sold more tickets in initial release still to date than any other film in history, even more than Gone with the Wind. Is that right? In initial release, not including re-releases and all that kind of stuff. Well, there was a, there was a quote that I – there was a statistic that I had read. I think – I'm almost positive. It actually, it was about Birth of a Nation, and the, the statistic was more people saw Birth of a Nation – as a percentage of the total country's population, yes, yes, than any film ever. That and that I believe is is a, is still holds true. I, I can imagine, uh, except for Modern Warfare Three. What? Except that for Car- three hundred million dollars in its first weekend. Except for Carrot Top, Chairman of the Board, That's huh? That, that, that movie, that 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 game, game? made three hundred million dollars in its first weekend. Awesome. It's ridiculous. 
What's wrong with America's youth? Uh, and then another D.W. Griffith film is Way Down East. This, is, uh, this was restored by the Museum of Modern Art, otherwise known as MoMA. That's what we call them. We call them MoMA. Uh, really a great restoration. This is, uh, you know, obviously not as famous as a lot of uh, Griffith other work, like uh, Birth of a Nation and Insignificance and, and whatnot. But still, you know, this is, uh, this is 1920. It's getting, it's later. It's a more sophisticated Griffith, and uh, it's not controversial. It, uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty, it's based on this uh, Lottie Blair play, Parker play, and uh, it's very melodramatic, as a lot of Griffith stuff often is. But it's it's got a real kind of pastoral Western, I don't know, John Steinbecky kind of quality to it. And uh, it, it's you know it it shows him furthering his skills as a filmmaker, which is interesting because this is getting very close to the end of his career because he never really transitioned to sound, which is the ironic thing. The guy who sort of invented the grammar for feature films. Couldn't really make that leap to sound. Just like the artist. Just like the artist. Very true. Very <laughs> Just true. like Jean Desjardins. But there are notes uh, on the play by uh, Lottie Blair Parker. Um, there are photos of the 1903 stage production. And uh, another Mont Alto Motion Pictures Orchestra score, which is just wonderful. Uh, it, it really pretty great. Beautiful Blu-ray. Beautiful Blu-ray. Uh, what else do we have? What, you, you, know, you, you teased a, a, a big deal criterion. I don't know what you were referring to. Should I get in? It's in the foreign pile. Do you want to dive into the foreign pile? Sure. Okay. Because we got a few other catalog titles, but some good foreign stuff. And by the way, we also have a letter that literally we just received as we were talking. Oh, did we? Yes. Oh, wow. I'm not going to tell you who it's from and what it says until the end of the show because it's a very nice uh, greeting. It's a very nice holiday greeting from somebody who does not live in the United States of America. And we will end the show on that greeting because it's very nice. Mark, I'm going uh, to rave about three foreign uh, films releasing this week. First, I'm, I'm not going to get to the big criteria. Oh, yet. That, one. that one. Yes. Let me see it. It's pretty spectacular. You wouldn't have to have two of those, would you? Uh, no. <laughs> I tried. You, you say that. The first you know. one is, uh, is from Lucas Belvaux. This is, uh, stars mm-hmm. Yvonne Attal, who is married, as it happens, to uh, Charlotte Gainsbourg, who we Didn't talked we about talk earlier. About this? Wrapped? Didn't we talk about no, that last week? No, we haven't talked about Wrapped. Uh-huh. No, Wrapped is on uh, on Blu-ray and on DVD. Wrapped is the film uh, when I was on the uh, my second stint on the City of Light, City of Angels, Cocoa Festival jury. Stop it. Name dropper. That's right. Uh, I saw Mr. Sulu. Yes, I know you. Now that's a name drop, and that's we worth. We gave it. this. We gave this our our, our top award. Yeah. Wrapped. Great, Mr. Sulu. You know what? Here's what's great about Wrapped. Wrapped is based on a true story. It's a it's a kidnapping film. We've seen a million of these, okay? You know, yeah, they kidnap the guy, and then how are they going to do the ransom, and they do the money drops, and all this, and so forth. But you know what's interesting about this? This is not about justice. This is not about bringing justice to the kidnappers. Uh, this is about how an inadvertent, unexpected turn winds up having a horrible negative effect on his life because of the revelations about his private life that come out as a result of the kidnapping. It's a very interesting dynamic. Uh, this film is so well done. It is so intense. You just cannot imagine. Uh, Lucas Belvaux did a great, great, great job with this. This is from Kino Lorber, uh, division of Kino. And um, it is just fabulous on Blu-ray, fabulous on Blu-ray. Um, such a moody, cool, slick film. It's the kind of thing Americans used to make in the 70s and just don't do anymore. But uh, Ivana Tal has never been better. And he's a filmmaker himself, a very talented director. But wow, what a great performance he does here. Everything is internalized. It is just a sensational performance. Another great film, Sarah's Key. A lot of you have read the book. Um, I did not read the book, but I know lots of housewives who just, oh, they just can't get enough of the book. Um, and uh, this is an absolutely sensational film. stars Kristen Scott Thomas. I hope they remember this when uh, award season comes. It was directed by Gilles Paquet Brenner, who I'm totally unfamiliar with. And this, there's another film coming out shortly that actually deals with this same event. Um, France is finally getting it together. There was a particularly uh, egregious moment in 1942 where uh, Jews in Paris were rounded up and they were put in the velodrome, the, the, the cycling stadium in Paris, and it turned into a real human catastrophe. I mean, there, were, there was no food, there was no water, there were no toilet facilities. It is, just, it is a notoriously horrible event 
in French history, and the uh, the history of French collaboration makes it very, very unacceptable to talk about. But here we are, you know, uh, sixty some, seventy some odd years later, and they're finally, you know, reconciling themselves to it in movies. Uh, Sarah's Key was a great novel, apparently, about this event. Uh, if I'm to judge from the movie, it must be an amazing novel because the movie had me in tears absolutely ripped me apart throughout. It takes place in two periods. It, it details a, a particular tragedy that transpires as a result of the, uh, the roundup in 1942, and then you have a present-day story starring uh, Kristen Scott Thomas as a journalist who discovers a family connection to that event. And you jump back and forth between the two. It's astonishing. Uh, the Blu-ray is gorgeous, one of the best I've seen all year, a tremendous transfer from Anchor Bay, really uh, top-notch, right at the top. Uh, the stuff that they've done, which obviously you have to give thanks to the Weinstein Company, who you know gave them the transfer. Anchor Bay is just releasing it, but it really, it's just tremendous. Unfortunately, no extras, just a, a featurette, which is kind of lame. But I'm hoping that maybe we get a special edition down the line. Oh, those Vichy French. All right, Mark. Here's the big mama this week. <laughs> Criterion Collection, Three Colors Trilogy, Blue, White, Red by Krzysztof Kieslowski. I know, I know what you're saying. You're saying, God, this is so artsy and foreign and lame. I love this movie. Not true. It's, well, it's three, three. it's three movies, but it's really one movie. Um, these were originally released. These are Miramax films. They're in the Miramax library. They were originally released uh, through the, the whole Disney thing. And here's what I find totally fascinating here. I looked on this, and I'm thinking, well, all this Bear Max stuff has been released lately by, uh, you know, all these, uh, all these other companies, you know, Anchor Bay and uh, – or not Anchor Bay, Lionsgate and, uh, and Echo Bridge. Um, you know, Echo Bridge, Anchor Bay, Bridge Bay, Bridge goes over the bay. You see where my head was. And I'm looking at this, and I'm looking for the Miramax logo. I'm like, well, they, they had to do a Criterion deal, right? Where's the Miramax? I don't see a Miramax logo, which – uh, you know, I see a Janus Films logo, and I see an MK2 logo, and I'm thinking, I'll bet the rights reverted. I'll bet m- this is no longer in the Miramax library. Which is why Criterion got their hands on it. Yeah. So quite, whoever it reverted to it, well, it, it clearly, had no interest in... It, it's fascinating. A- MK2 must have just uh, given Miramax a very, very short uh, license on this, which, you know, I can't imagine Harvey negotiating at the time, but it turned out. Anyway... This is a tremendous set, beautifully packaged. Um, if you haven't seen these three films, they're amazing. They're based on three colors of the French flag. Uh, the Blu-rays are to die for. The movies are photographed with such spectacular meticulousness. And um, there are three completely different stories that somehow kind of connect in a way that I won't tell you about. But um, they nearly won the Triple Crown with these films uh, at the festivals. The uh, Ve- Venice, the uh, white won Venice, blue won Berlin, and red should have won Cannes in 1994 when I was there. Unfortunately, Clint was the jury president. He screwed everything up and uh, gave it to Pulp Fiction instead. So... There we go. That's my gripe. But uh, I can't even begin to tell you how many awesome things there are on the extras here. It's just... It's, Each one. Oh, my gosh. They're, it's just loaded beyond all comprehension. Interviews and documentaries and television specials. And it's just... It, it'll come out of your ears. You could literally sit around for three days watching these movies and the extras and not run out of stuff. And you're going to be enthralled by all of it. This is one of the best uh, Blu-ray collections I've ever seen. Unbelievable. That is true. Three films about what, Wade... Liberty, fraternity, and equality. Égalité. Yes. Liberté, fraternité, égalité. Oh, Jesus Christ. You know, well, there we go. Fa, fa, fa. Um, uh, let's, uh, Mark, let's talk yes, about... Yes, sir. Well, hang on. What are we doing? Uh, this is just so much to deal with, and we've got so little time left. Um, you're a giant fan of that, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Oh, what my the, God. Why not, right? Who directed this? Simon Winsor. Uh, <laughs> a very young Tom Selleck stars in Quigley Down Under. Now, Quigley Down Under was, you know, it was a movie at the time. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, wow, can, it's Quigley Down you Under. Can, you can tell. We just, I, look, folks, honestly, there's, what are you going to say about a Blu-ray of Quigley Down Under? You're a Tom Selleck fan? Just well, go get it. It's, <laughs> this is like, why even bother reviewing? Because it's Tom Selleck. <laughs> You know, I'll tell you, I, I think I've said this before on the show, but I, I met Tom Selleck once. I, I produced him on a talk show. He's a very, very nice man. He's also incredibly handsome. Like, oh, I he's know. like the ultimate, like, handsome guy. He's one of the sweetest like the guys around. Rugged, handsome dude. 
We're gonna anyway, quickly down under. Uh, make it quick, because we got. Yeah, I know it's terrible. quickly down under. It's, 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 it, you, you know, know it's, it's 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 a widget. It's, it's on blue, right? It's a it's a widget. Another one of those is Three Amigos. Uh, <gasps> are you seriously a fan of Three yeah, Amigos? Yeah, come are you really. It's kind of funny. Oh my gosh! Oh come on, Three Amigos. You, you're get kidding. Some. Oh my gosh! How can you not love Three Amigos? Well, that's it. That's out on Blu-ray too. Knock yourself out. What? <laughs> you really don't like Three Amigos? What? It's like it's this. It's just silly. It's silly twaddle. What's wrong with that? You uh, don't like silly twaddle? Yeah, not all the time. Hey, but anyway, it's on Blu-ray. It's got a few. El extras. Guapo. It's all about El Guapo. Yeah, I guess you love El Guapo. You He's know what? Your... I, you know what I do like El Guapo. Uh, just to get a little more serious here, I'll tell you what I do like is. Do you know what nada means? Isn't that a light chicken gravy? Huh? Are we cooking? Yeah, that's from the movie. Oh gosh. Like, I would remember that. Uh, you know, in 1962, they did another version of Mutiny on the Bounty. And uh, not the old uh, Clark Gable version with Charles Lawton. Is, is <gasps> oh, this, this is the original one. Yes. I thought this was the remake. No, no, I'm talking about Mutiny on the Bounty now. I don't care. I'm we're talking doing, about we're this. Doing, we're doing a whole original remake m- moment here. In uh, I'm keeping this. Let me finish. Let me finish this. this. Just say yes. I'm keeping this. You're, you're keeping three amigos. Really? You won't let me have this. You don't like this. What do you care about movie. this movie? You do not. I do love that movie. Seriously, love Jerk. that movie. <laughs> okay, Mutiny on the Bounty, the uh, 1962 remake with Marlon Brando uh, as uh, uh, Fletcher Christian. As Quigley is actually a pretty interesting film. In many respects, I actually like this better. Now, here's what's weird. This is one of this is a later film from Lewis Milestone, who was a big deal in the early sound era. You know, Lewis Milestone did the uh, the All second Quiet on the Western All Front, Quiet, which won, which was the first sound film to win an Academy Award for Best Picture, uh, 1928. And um, it, it's a completely different kind of a film. I mean, Lewis Milestone really, really honed his talents and kind of grew into a much more sophisticated filmmaker. And this wound up being actually, I think, one of the better films that he made. I'm sorry that the um, the definitive version uh, that was to be called The Bounty was never made by David Lean. That was going to be a two-part film. And they actually wanted Christopher Reeve to play uh, Fletcher Christian in that. Did you know that? Really? That would have been fascinating. And then that project fell apart, and it turned into the Roger Donaldson one-part Mel Gibson film, The Bounty, which is good, but it ain't, you know, a David Lean film. It's a bummer. Some of these great films just never happen. Anyway, uh, you know the story. You know, it's a mutiny, and uh, it's, it's on The Bounty, and, you know, Captain Bly is a, is a real bastard. Ooh. And uh, Trevor Howard is a great, uh, you know, really tremendous Captain Bly in this. And Richard Harris also shows up. He's, he's fabulous as John Mills. So, uh, you know, this is a good cast. Harris, Howard, Brando, fantastic. A lot of great extras on here. Uh, Blended Blu-ray transfer. It's just it has that glow that movies in the '60s had that they just don't have anymore. I don't know what the problem is. Um, they have an alternate prologue and epilogue sequences on here, um, which I had never seen before, and nothing special. But the original featurettes are uh, just so much fun. Uh, you know, they they just made featurettes differently back then, and these are great. These are terrific. So, gotta check that one out. And then another uh, another nice vintage film is The Big Country, which is uh, a little bit dated as a western, but Gregory Peck is very uh, very star like, and the uh, the music is classic. Uh, Charlton Heston, you know what? Kind of embarrassing, I thought. Uh, I don't think his performance holds up as well as I had remembered. But uh, William Wyler nails this, and uh, the music. I, I got to tell you, the mu- it's all about the music. Just sit down and listen to the music. You will go nuts. No extras though. Speaking of no extras, Wade. We have um, yeah. the original, The Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3, one of my favorite films as a kid. I know. And you're not letting me have it. Um, no. Walter Matthau plays a uh, New York City uh, transit cop. And while on his watch, a, a New York City subway train is hijacked by Robert Shaw from Jaws. Oh. And uh, Martin Balsam sneezes. This was uh, based on the book, and it was remade by Tony Scott. And there's two there's two Tony Scotts, the uh, one that makes uh, you know Crimson Tide and Man on Fire. Then there's the other Tony Scott. I know. We got the other Tony Scott, where the uh, this film, which everybody loved so much back in the day, was remade into crap. So if you need to see the Taking Pelham One Two Three, please see the original. It includes a great score by David Shire, uh, one of my favorite David Shire scores. I love it, and uh, it's a great film. Walter Matthau is his grisly best. And uh, did I mention that Martin Balsam sneezes? Uh, the movie looks great. You know, Martin Balsam was the original um, Dr. Uh, Rudy in the Six Million Dollar Man, the movie. You know, the you original, realize also... He was the original... Uh, no, 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 no. What? I have something better. 
Okay. For a brief moment. What? Might not have been that brief. Stanley Kubrick considered Martin Balsam to, as, to be the voice of Hal. No, that wouldn't have worked. You didn't know that? I didn't know that. Really? No. Stanley Kubrick was con- seriously considering Martin Balsam as the voice of Hal. Huh. In 2001. Well, how about that? <laughs> Here. <laughs> okay, we've got some... Lame. Uh, Looks great, by the way. Oh, I, I said that. The movie yeah. looks great on Blu-ray. We, we got some uh, Manufacture on Demand MOD releases from MGM, and uh, these are all curiosities. I don't know if I can recommend any of them, but they're all kind of little fringe, eccentric film film nerd curiosities. Uh, one of these is an Alan Rudolph film, and it seems like everything Alan Rudolph does is somewhere on the fringe. Uh, this is from 1976. It's called Welcome to L.A., and he wrote and directed it, and his good buddy Robert Altman produced it. And uh, it's got all those people who are kind of part of that real kind of uh, 70s beatnik-y, actory Altman scene. Keith Carradine, you know, and Geraldine Chaplin had been in uh, Nashville for Altman. And then Harvey Keitel and Sally Kellerman are also in the mix. Sally Kellerman, of course, had been in uh, MASH for Altman, and Keitel was just doing everything for everybody at the time. <laughs> But uh, I don't know. It's just it's 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 basically kind of like a, a wannabe uh, Cassavetes film, to be honest. And it, sometimes Altman, you know, put his name on stuff just as a favor and and hoped that you know it's somehow he would carry it through. Alan Rudolph gets some good performances out of these people, but when he kind of gets, I don't know. It just the thing it never, with Rudolph, it never coalesces. No, well, actually, you know what? I, I don't think. Uh, it's like just a bunch of weird people in L.A. It's just like, the, like here, here, these are weird people. They live in L.A. and look how weird they are. But that's his thing. I mean, I don't think, I mean, Rudolph always came off to me as the poor man's Robert Altman. And not that he didn't do decent films. He, he did a couple of good movies, I guess. Choose yeah. Me is all right. And, I like you know, Choose Me. You know, the moderns, people like that. Miss, actually, Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle I kind of yeah, liked. Yeah. Um, but I just feel like he never really yeah. broke through the shadow of Robert Altman. I Although, agree. Welcome to L.A. was... One of his more popular films is contemporary, had a good cast. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, you know, Mark and I are fans of the great era of Borscht Belt comics, and one of them who has just completely fallen off of everyone's radar is Maury Amsterdam. Maury Amsterdam is one hell of a funny guy. If you are not familiar with his shtick, boy, are you missing out. And you should definitely at least rent uh, Don't Worry, We'll Think of a Title. Uh, this movie has just I, I, I don't think I even knew that this ever existed uh, this is uh, really this is a late 60s film that was uh, written by Maury Amsterdam and which stars Maury Amsterdam it was meant to be kind of a vehicle for him and it never really got a, a film career off the ground for him um, but at least he went out there and kind of tried to put it all together terrific cast I mean some gr- Rose Marie you know who's always a good supporting uh, player is in this um, it's it's really rooted in its era. I'll say that it's very much in the space race moment. Uh, there's like this wacky Soviet cosmonaut. Uh, it, 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 there's just no way to describe it. It's like a Jerry Lewis movie with Maury Amsterdam instead of Jerry Lewis. But what a really cool, weird, eccentric little um, little gem. And then we also have a for Rod Serling fans. There was a short story that he had written that was the basis for this movie, Incident in an Alley, and um, it's basically about a cop who accidentally shoots a kid and during a robbery and then it just drives him nuts it's very psychological extremely well done very gritty very cool black and white um kind of low budget but um you know very much in the uh in the rod serling vein and uh i think it's awfully cool the guy who directed it edward l Kahn, really doesn't hasn't done anything else of of note in, in his career so uh you know uh, another interesting curiosity probably more of a rental than a buy byron to burn no, just, uh, you know. And then lastly, um, Mark, I know you don't know that this movie probably even existed, do you? Lost Horizon, the musical? Um, no. Are you familiar with this? Is it like Quigley Down Under? I, c- I couldn't believe it when I saw the announcement for this. This is a, uh, a Sony DVD, and um, I never thought that this would ever actually come out, because this is considered one of the worst films ever made. Lost Horizon, the original, is a Frank Capra film, which, as everyone knows, uh, we're still looking for the actual director's cut. You, uh, what you get on DVD kind of has uh, some you know, missing portions spliced in with uh, you know, sketches and drawings and whatnot. They're still t- trying to put the Frank Capra film together, which is considered a masterpiece. Well, um, this film is not a masterpiece. This is from 1972, and it, uh, it's a musical. It's, uh, it's Lost Horizon as a musical. It has Peter Finch, Liv Ullman, 
um, Michael York, Olivia Hussey. It's uh, George Kennedy. It's a very, very 70s cast. John Gilgood shows up briefly, kind of ridiculous. But uh, the whole idea here was we are going to do basically The Sound of Music crossed with Lost Horizon. And the result, I have to say, I'm very fond of. I'm fond of it because I saw it as a kid, and so I have fond memories of it. I also like Burt Bacharach, who did all the songs. Um, but, uh, boy, I'll tell you, if I kind of extract all of my nostalgia from this, this is really a bad movie. It's re- I could see how it was an embarrassment at the time. But, uh, you know, I have, I have childhood nostalgia from having seen this, so I... Uh it's a cool cat, you know. Peter Finch. He look. He won a posthumous Oscar for uh, Network. I know. So uh, he's 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 a real guy. Yeah. Lee Allman, of course, is one of the great uh, European. Uh, it just it just goes to show you that when you see something as a kid and you remember it well, it it that radiates into your adulthood. Why won't they come out with the big bus on Blu-ray? I have no idea. I love that movie. Look out! He's got a broken milk carton. Don't make me sing the Six Months to Live song because I will. <laughs> I will sing the entire Six Months to Live. That song. is a brilliant movie. I do love that movie. That's a great movie. It's Wait, a tremendous movie. We are almost about to uh, read the uh, the closing email we just received during the show. Well, listen, let's knock out a few of these, uh, a few of the uh, the, the television uh, thingamajigs because we got some uh, television replaces smellivision. Exactly. Um, Dennis Farina uh, starred in a show twenty five years ago called Crime Story. Now, Crime Story is not only a Dennis Farina thing, but it was. Um, I don't know if it was created by, but it was definitely executive produced by Michael, Michael Mann. Mann. And it uh, features, as we said, Dennis Farina. And uh, does this show hold up? Uh, I didn't watch this whole thing, obviously, but, uh, you know, it's kind of cute. <laughs> it, <laughs> Very young David Caruso uh, shows up in this. It's okay. I mean, there's, a lot, there's actually a lot of great guest stars. Lorraine Bracco is, is, uh, is a guest star here. Julia Roberts, believe it or not. Gary Sinise, Kevin Spacey. Uh, David Hyde Pierce, Andrew Dice Clay is a is a guest star here. You know, Michael Mann. Um, he was sort of still discovering, you know, what would become trademarks of his work. Yeah. Uh, but there's definitely some good stuff here. Uh, I have not seen the new uh, Tintin movie I have. or Tintin, uh, and I'll let you weigh in on the movie. But uh, you know, there was actually a television series, uh, Tintin. In the early 90s, The Adventures of uh, Tintin, or Tintin, depending on what pronunciation you're going to go with. And uh, I had never seen it. I had no idea. This is the, um, the first season, 13 episodes, and it's not bad. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I feel like it's probably more faithful to the spirit of the uh, comic books than the new horrible motion capture thing that I'm terrified to see. But I'll let you weigh in on that. Anyway, two discs here and uh, 13 episodes. And, uh, you know, if you, if you love the comic book, it's very, very faithful artwork. All I'll say about the movie is, uh, looks great, didn't care about anybody or anything. Because, you know, I was talking to our friend Tim Cogshill about this before uh, we, went, we went to the artist. And, you know, there's a difference between something like Tintin, which looks great. You know, there's like a 10-minute chase scene that's like one quote-unquote shot. Right. You know, so it looks great. But you just don't care. And the difference between that and other thrill rides is that, like... I don't care what you say. I loved Indiana Jones. I wanted to hang out yep. with that guy. I, I thought he you. was the coolest guy ever. I wanted to be with him. Wanted to hang out with All him. Wanted that. to go where he went. That, so it was a thrill ride with somebody I wa- I wanted to spend time with. But Tintin doesn't have that. Last title before Mark reads us the uh, DVD. We're going to ruin your uh, Thanksgiving with the um, a PBS release on Blu-ray or DVD of My Life as a Turkey, part of the series Nature. And uh, you know what? This is gonna. This is uh, seriously. If you uh, if you want to learn to love turkeys and feel insanely guilty about actually ever eating them, this is what you want to watch. This is uh, this treats turkeys as if they were people. Um, really, actually, quite good. But seriously, don't watch it if you actually want to have a great Thanksgiving and eat turkey. Mark, read us that letter. This is a very uh, special uh, letter we have. Wade, that's going to send us into the holidays. Are you ready? Yes. Do it, dear Wade and Mark. Just wanted to take a minute of your time and wish you and your loved ones a happy Thanksgiving. Looking forward to stories of how much weight you gained from all the stuffing. All the best, Alexander Berlika. Oh, that's awesome. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome because they don't have Thanksgiving over in his part of the world. They do not. However, I believe that he should have at least a chicken McNugget in honor of Thanksgiving. Alexander, we're going to send you all of our Thanksgiving leftovers. (laughs) 